Hello everyone and welcome to the Creo Tips and Tricks session. My name is Paul Sager. For those of you not familiar with this type of session, at Liveworks each year we have a session presented by the CAD product management team, where each of us present a quick five minute tip on capabilities in Creo that you as a customer may not have been aware of. Over the years we have covered many areas of the product and this year is no exception. Let's jump right into it. First off, we have Martin, who's going to present tips of using multi-body design capability to better visualize your fluid cavities. Martin, over to you. Welcome to another tip in the context of our Creo Tips and Tricks series. The tip and trick today will be around the multi-body concept introduced in Creo 7 and uh, about what it can do for the design of fluid cavities such as a, a part containing a cooling circuit or a hydraulic manifold similar to the one shown here. Using multibody has many advantages in the design of those fluid ways, but in the tip here we actually want to start with an existing design and turn the fluid ways into additional solid bodies to increase flexibility in visualization, uh, analysis and, and other downstream workflows. To start the process, we're going to make use of a new tool called Internal Volume that is part of the Fluid Analysis Package and it allows me to have the system go off and automatically find cavities or internal volumes based on boundary surface selection. The result is returned in form of a quilt which I can then solidify and with the option in the body panel uh, to create a new body, I have uh, I can have Creo create a body for me and put the created solid volume into that new body. This new body represents all fluid cavities, so let me rename it accordingly. And already now you can see that having the manifold in one body and the cavities in another body can help with the visualization of the fluid ways. But now we want not only a body that represents all cavities, we uh, would rather want a body per fluid way. And in order to do that, I created a, a copy of the all cavities body. And I'm going to use that copy to incrementally cut off or split out the individual cavity volumes. I use the split body tool for that, leveraging the volume option that allows me to separate out a disjoint volume of a body into a new body. Note that it is uh, actually a, a big advantage of the Creo multibody implementation that we can have multiple disjoint volumes within a single body. And uh, now I'm step by step splitting out the individual disjoint volumes of the cavity body into the individual fluid ways. And of course, we can then color all these bodies separately and also use color coding to make the design intent more transparent, uh, better visualize the shape and relative position of the fluid ways in the context of each other uh, and control entire visibility. So this gives you a lot of flexibility in the visualization um, of the, let's say, the, the positive geometry um, rather than the, the, the cavities. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, the ability to exclude certain bodies from visualization in the cross-section mode. Um, that, that can help very much with um, improved visualization. We have the ability to um, isolate selected bodies and also do pairs clearance between uh, pairs of bodies so um, that we can on one hand see interference but also uh, ensure we have certain wall thicknesses or clearances uh, fulfilled. I could even use flexible modeling to uh, tweak them and modify uh, the geometry of the, the individual bodies if, if I needed to. Um, and finally, what I want to show here is, of course, that we can use uh, the view manager layer states to quickly switch between the individual representations and visualizations. So far for the tip today. I hope you liked the tip and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Martin. Great tip. 
I know most of you have not moved to Creo 7 yet, but see this as another reason to accelerate that move. Next we have Jose, who is going to present tips for creating cooling channels that can be 3D printed. Jose, over to you. In this demonstration, we will use a part that will be manufactured using a plastic mold. Here we have the 3D model. Let's take a look now at the mold assembly in Creo Mold Design application, where the core and cavity were designed. For this part of this demo, let's work with the core. As shown in this model, traditionally the cooling channels were defined by straight segments that can be drilled. With 3D printing as an alternative manufacturing process, we can produce more efficient cooling channels that can conform better to the shape of our 3D designs, with higher thermal efficiency to cool down the molds. In the screen, we're using Creo Simulate Live to simulate the pressure drop and the velocity inside the cooling channels. Now, let's create a tray assembly with the elliptical cooling channel with circular cross section and calculate the support structures using a parameter of 40 degrees as the self supporting angle. It's a, a capability, it's a combination of uh, material and uh, printer capability, etc. Let's say 40 degrees is something that is feasible with our uh, additive process. We can observe that for a case like this, it is possible that we can end up with trapped support structures. The issue of having trapped supports depends on the size of the cross sections, the material, printer capabilities, etc. Just assume that we need a better design alternative. A feasible alternate design is to use a water drop cross section geometry which can follow a path near to the core surface, as we can see on the screen at this moment. One design consideration is that the tip of the drop is formed by a 90 degree angle, giving us 45 degrees in each side. Let's prepare this model for 3D printing and calculate the support structures using the same profile done in the elliptical coil previously shown. By using the clipping capability, we will validate if all the internal geometries of the cooling channel are self-supported and see if we have been successful in achieving our goal. We can see here there is no internal support, so I think this is a successful design. As demonstrated before, we can perform flow analysis on this new configuration, as we can see on the screen. We can simulate pressure drop, we can simulate velocity, Etc. For the second part of the demo, let's work now with the cavity of the same mold. Here we will explain the trick to create a drop shaped cooling channel that is self supported. We are using the sweep functionality using the sketch to define the cross section. There are other alternatives to this cross-section, for instance, diamond shape. After the cross-section is defined, we select the option normal to projection. This will force the sweep to maintain the tip of the drop always pointing upward when we use a reference parallel to the built plane. To conclude, we can simulate the flow, the fluid flow, as in the previous, uh, the first, uh, first uh, part of this demo, 
Here we have velocity, particles flowing inside the channels. Here we have the validation, the tray assembly, that we don't have any traces of supports that are usually marked in yellow. So this is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. That was pretty cool. Next, we have Arno, who will be showing you how to set up planetary gears in Creo. Arno, the floor is yours. Hi. In this tip, I'd like to show how you can create a planetary gear assembly in Mechanism. I'll run through some basic assembly work, adding the required components with pin connections into the basic assembly. In this example, we have a ground plate, a carrier, the housing ring, a sun, and we'll start off with the first planet gear. While adding these parts with pin connections, I also rename the connections so later in mechanism it's easy to identify and select the correct motion axis during the gear pair definition. In mechanism, we will define two gear pairs for each planet. Here I will start with the Sun to planet definition and you see the motion axis name being helpful. Then I will add the housing to planet gear pair and we're ready for the first test. While dragging, I will lock the housing body and move the carrier, and I can also try it the other way around. But as you see, this is not working correctly. The main tip is actually to define the motion axes in the correct direction. In this example I want the motion axis of the Sun gear to point down so I need to flip the definition. You can also check this by looking at the rotation axis in the connection definition. Now checking the housing ring, I want this to point up, which it already is. Now let's redefine the gear pairs to ensure the planet directions are also correct. In the Sun pair definition, I want the planet to be opposite of the Sun, so it should point up. We can flip that here in the gear definition. In the housing pair definition, I want the planet to be the same direction, also pointing up. So we flip the direction of the planet gear. Let's now check moving this mechanism as before. That's all looking good now, so I can add the remaining two planet gears. 
These will get the exact same definitions as the first. Each planet needs two gear pairs in Creo mechanism. So now they all work as we want them to. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Arno. I hope you all found that useful. Next up is Mark, who will be showing you how to use behavioral modeling to find the smallest size box for packaging a product. Mark, over to you. In this tip, we'll go through a packaging exercise for the part on the screen. This part has been simplified to remove the internal details as I only am concerned with the external shape. The objective is to create a foam insert that will store the part to be used for shipping. We'll use behavior modeling to optimize the orientation of the part and minimize the insert volume. Once created, we'll use the optimized shape to determine the cardboard box that will be needed to store the insert and part. As we are using Creo 7, we'll take advantage of the new multi-body capabilities. This part currently only has one body, so we'll create a new body to define the insert definition. Normally we would create a series of features to be used for the optimization. I have simplified the process by creating a user-defined feature which will help in the future for other parts. Selecting the UDF icon from the modeling tab, I can select the boundary box UDF. Based on the UDF setup, we are being asked to select the corresponding references. Immediately the UDF is created, and we could change the color of the body to make it easier to visualize. Expanding the UDF group, we can see all the defined features, from the analysis features, geometry, and measures. All will be used in the optimization. Clicking the Analysis tab and the Optimization command, we could start to define the optimization. For this optimization, the goal will be to minimize the volume of the insert body by the following constraints. In our example, we'll set each measure to be 5 millimeters. Clicking the Insert body, we can include each of the dimensions for the insert and also include the access references for the orientation of the body. The range for the dimensions will be between 0 and 550 millimeters, while the axis degrees will be between negative 179 degrees to positive 179 degrees. To help visualize the optimization, we'll animate the results as the solver is calculating the optimal size. Clicking Compute, we can now see the model update based on each iteration as charted out in the graph. Once converged on the optimal shape, we can close the graph and exit the study. Now we can create both the left and right side of the insert. This can easily be done using the multi-body capabilities in Creo 7. We will first make a copy of the insert body and paste a new body which we'll rename as side A. Then we can use the boolean operation to subtract the part from the side A body. Clicking keep bodies we can then complete the boolean operation. Then we'll split the body in half using the selected datum plane. This will create a new body for half the insert, which we'll call a side B. Let's go look at the bodies for side A and side B. We could take this a little further and create a new part for each body, which we can then send to the printer or another manufacturing process to be created. With that completed, we can now create the cardboard box part that will be sized to the insert. Right clicking on the insert body, we can now choose to create a new part from body. We'll call this part cardboard box. With that new part open, we'll convert the part to sheet metal and define the thickness for the cardboard. In our example, we'll use one millimeter.
Now we'll need to add all the necessary features such as bends and edge rips to allow it to be flattened. Clicking the conversion icon we can select the edge rip function to choose the desired edges of the part which we want to rip. This will create all the necessary bends in accordance to the rip edges selected. With that defined we can now unbend the geometry. Through this tip you can see how easy it is to leverage the power of behavioral modeling to create an optimized body based on the original part. With this process defined it can easily be used with any part in your library. Thanks Mark. I think that clearly showed the power that is available today when using behavioral modeling. Next up is Nihal, who'll be walking through the process to borrow a Creo license to allow users to work remotely. Nihal, all yours. Hi, today I'm going to present a tip about borrowing a Creo license file. Given that most users are working remotely due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it becomes very important to be able to access Creo remotely and consistently. Let's start by viewing the status of the license server. As you can see, there are 10 licenses available and none of them are in use. I will now go into the Creo installation folder. I'm going to run the batch file parametric underscore borrow. As you can see, I can choose how many days I want to borrow the license for, with the default max limit being 5 days. Let me borrow the license file for the max duration and start Creo. Now, if I go back and check the status of my license server, I can see that it reflects that one license is in use and only nine are available. You can see here that the license has been borrowed till May 17th. If I disconnect from the license server, I will still be able to run Creo for the duration of the borrow period without needing to connect to the license server again. To return a borrowed license early, I will run command prompt and set the destination path as follows. Then I will run the license return command and provide my port, server name and license feature name. As you can see, I've successfully returned the borrowed license. If I check the status of the license server again, I will see that all 10 licenses are available and none are in use. To extend the default maximum duration of a borrowed license, I will need to set a system variable. Let's right click on this PC and choose properties. Access the advanced system settings and select environment variables under advanced. Now, I will add a new system variable called lm underscore borrow underscore duration and provide 179 as the variable value. Let me say OK and save this. Let's go back into the Creo installation folder and try to borrow a license again. As you can see, it is now possible to borrow a license for up to 180 days. To recap, let's go over the workflow once again. Remember, you need to ensure you're connected to the license server 
and that the admin has enabled license borrowing. Navigate to Creo install directory and run the batch file to borrow a license. Choose the borrowing period less than five days and start Creo. Subsequent launches of Creo will not require connection to the license server for the duration of the borrowed license. To return a borrowed license early, run command prompt and choose the path as follows. Run the command to return a borrowed license, providing your port, your server name, and your license feature name. To extend the maximum duration of the borrowed license, right-click on My PC, go into Properties, go into Advanced System Settings, and choose Environment Variables. Add a new system variable called lm underscore borrow underscore duration and provide n, which could be less than or equal to 179. You can now borrow a license for up to 180 days without connecting to the license server. Thank you. Thanks, Nihal. In today's climate of remote working, I think that tip was very relevant. Next is Michael, who's going to present three tips on working with annotations and detailing. Michael? Hello, everyone. Today I have three mini tips that might improve your productivity when working with annotations. The first tip is about your ability to control whether your leader annotation or balloon will be snapping to the normal tangent guides. In my example here, I have a drawing with several balloons that I would like to adjust. When I'm moving balloon number four, I can see that it is being snapped to the normal guide. If I want to turn off the snapping for more accurate placement of the balloon, I now have a new checkbox to turn it off. In addition, we have added a new config.pro option annotation underscore snap underscore to underscore guide underscore range that lets you control the default sensitivity of the snapping or turn it off by default. The next tip is about new keyboard shortcut that will allow you to add box formatting to note annotations as you type them. All you need to do is activate the Notes on Screen Editor and click Control Left Bracket Shortcut key to open the box formatting and the same when you want to close it. And finally, the third tip is about another config.pro option that could save you some clicks and time. When working with models that are set to ISO tolerancing standards, you might have noticed that once you want to add a tolerance to a dimension, you would first need to change the tolerance table type to none before you will be able to change the tolerance values freely. Instead of doing this switch for every time, we have added the new config.pro option, default underscore ISO underscore toll underscore table underscore type, that will help you to set the default tolerance table up front and save time. So just to summarize, all of the tips that I've showed you today are new with Creo 4 M130 and in a few other releases of Creo. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Three tips in one. That's great. Next is Luke, who will be showing tips on AR Design Chair and also using Model Check with multi-body parts in Creo 7. Luke, over to you. My name is Luke Westbrook, and I am a Creo product manager, and I'm going to be showing you today a tip uh, regarding how to show and hide parts within an assembly when viewing that assembly in augmented reality using AR Design Share. So the first thing that I need to do is actually set up my spatial target, um, and so I'm going to, to place it, and that, that essentially just defines where the uh, floor, where the ground in, the, in real life 
uh, in the real world interacts with the digital model uh, in AR. So once I've set that, then I'm going to go ahead and enter my ptc.com credentials, give the, the model a new name if I so desire, and then I'm going to select a high viewable quality. And I could choose high or medium. You don't want to choose low if you're wanting to be able to, to hide and show uh, models because the low kind of strips out some of those, uh, some of those internal models. So I've go, gone ahead and published that. And then I'll go in to uh, share this model. So you can see I've just published that. You can see I've just published that. And, uh, and so then I can scan the QR code on my uh, smartphone or my tablet. And then I'll go ahead and, and place the, the engine here in my living room here. And that's at, at full scale, one-to-one. -one. That is the size of the Interceptor engine. And so I just tap with my finger, just tap on that housing and then I can press the hide button and see all the internals and so again using my finger I can just tap uh, on some of these some of these parts here and then hide those and uh, you know again I can tap multiple at a time and hide those and then I can just press the show button that will kind of go reverse through the stack and show everything that I've just hidden and again I can uh, select uh, some of these parts here to again show what's inside and, and really get a better feel for what's going on inside of the engine uh, versus just seeing the externals and then I can unhide everything and kind of go back to where to where I started. For this tip I'm going to show you how you can check the material assignments per body for your multi-body part and make sure that the materials uh, fit within a predefined list of, of materials. So the first thing you're going to want to do is check your start file to set up that list of allowed materials. And those need to be material names found within your materials library. So I've got four here. And then what you want to do is you want to add the material info check to your checks file. So here I'm going to scroll down to material info and I have set the uh, set it to show an error when I run model check interactive. So now when I run that, it's going to show me that I've got an error because neither of my bodies has a material assigned to it. It's just got the the system material properties. So I can see there's those there are those four materials that I had defined and that I had defined. And I'm going to set the master material. And, uh, and then I'll set the, the overmold to be silicone. Now the housing, if, since I haven't set that, it will actually follow the master material. So now I've updated that and I can rerun the check and you'll see that I don't have any more errors anymore. And so then looking at the two bodies that I have, I can take a look at the housing and see what the material assignment is there. And it's, it's following the master, as I mentioned before. And then looking at the overmold, I can see that it's the silicone rubber um, and regenerating that's going to take care of uh, the regeneration errors because, uh, you know, I have some some mass properties later on in the uh, in the part. Thanks, Luke. Two great tips there. Next, we have Todd, who's going to show you a tip for transferring pressure distribution from Creo flow analysis into Creo simulate. Todd, all yours. The tip that I'm showing today will be for transferring a pressure distribution from Creo Flow Analysis into Creo Simulate. We will start obviously in Creo Flow with this fire hose nozzle. And then we're going to use the wizard to select our physics and create our fluid body and add it to our simulation. Then we proceed with the wizard step by step with the fluid selection and also in defining the boundary conditions for the inlet and the outlet of our analysis. The wizard will then proceed with us to mesh the model and then run the flow simulation. This one's very simple, it runs very quickly and then in our results is the tip that I want to highlight. We have the, the boundary conditions for the inlet and the outlet surfaces. But we want to select the other body, which represents the walls of our simulation. We go into the Creo Flow window and we ask for the pressure distribution to be written to a Creo Simulate file for an output. We run it one more time and then we can see this file in our, our working directory. In this case, I'm going to rename it 
to a shorter, shorter name, and this is a FNF file. Once we're complete with that, we've completed the work in Creo Flow. We can now enter Creo Simulate with this same model and then go ahead and set up our static simulation. The first step is to apply a constraint. And then the next step, we're going to use that pressure uh, file, the FNF file, to apply a pressure load inside of Creo Simulate. It's under the advanced uh, selection window and we pick external coefficients field. We enter a value of one for our, our factor and then we can go ahead and preview that result of what that distribution looks like. Looks great. So now we just have to assign a material as our last step for setup and we're gonna, going to go ahead and pick on uh, stainless steel for this simulation. The last step is to run this in Creo Simulate. So we can then um, look at the results uh, for stress and uh, displacement. This just takes a, a few seconds to solve and mesh, and then we can look at the results. In this case, we want to just look at the results for von Mises stress and the results for uh, displacement. So that's how you transfer the, uh, the FNF file from Creo Flow to Creo Simulate to get your results. Any license of Creo Flow and any license of Creo Simulate will enable, enable you to do this. And then you can um, transfer any pressure or you can also transfer temperature distribution into Creo Simulate to get your results. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. I hope you all learned something there. Finally, we have Andy, who will be showing you how to leverage the engineering notebook to perform engineering calculations with Creo and MathCAD. Andy, over to you. Hello, my name is Andrew McGough. I'm a product manager in the CAD segment of PTC, and I'd like to talk to you about how you can use engineering calculations to drive dimensions and ultimately the design of your model in Creo. Uh, to do this, we use an integration with PTC MathCAD called the Engineering Notebook. And that integration effectively allows you to embed a PTC MathCAD into your Creo part of assembly and then use its engineering calculations to drive parameters in Creo. Now, you can do this if you have a commercial version of PTC MathCAD Prime uh, 3.1 or later, um, or you can also use the trial version of uh, PTC MathCAD as the um, integration um, is enabled uh, using that trial version. So, Firstly, what we need to do is go to the um, applications uh, tab on Creo uh, and select PTC MathCAD. Um, here we have a very simple uh, spring part. Um, you can create a worksheet, or I have a worksheet that I could already insert here that details some spring design that I want to use to drive dimensions uh, of that spring in Creo. So this particular worksheet, um, as you see, opens in, in MathCAD. Um, if you go back to Creo, you can see that there's a, uh, a glyph in Creo uh, that now indicates that there's an embedded MathCAD worksheet. And if you click that, it'll open that worksheet in MathCAD. So this MathCAD worksheet is a simple worksheet that has some input conditions, a solve block that is used to optimize, in this particular case, the weight of certain uh, um, parameters of the spring. Uh, uh, and then it defines what those parameters are. Now, what we can do is assign um, the important parameters as outputs. And what that does is it allows us to take these and share them with Creo, such that in Creo, when you go to the parameters table, uh, you'll see these parameters uh, that are sourced from MathCAD and you can use them within Creo. Um, you can also uh, tag um, parameters in MathCAD as inputs to MathCAD from Creo. Uh, and I'm going to assign an input here because we're going to get, get some information back from Creo. So once we do that, we can save and share those values with Creo. Um, so now we have a MathCAD worksheet with some parameters. Now, if you go to Tools and Parameters and take a look at the embedded MathCAD worksheet um, uh, view, you'll be able to see those parameters that are now shared. And you can now 
use these in relations within Creo um, and link them to dimensions to drive dimensions. So we'll do that. What we'll do is we'll take um, relations. I've created some relations already. Um, and what these relations do is um, assign those three outputs from MathCAD to dimensions of the spring and takes uh, a, a, a dimension from the spring um, and passes that back to MathCAD. So once I verify this um, and regenerate the model, you'll see the spring change because we now using values from the MathCAD worksheet to determine certain parameters in the spring. Uh, now you see the, the height of the spring change and the dimension of the coil has changed as well. Now we have uh, a notification here saying that we have an outdated MathCAD worksheet and that's because uh, we pushed this value from Creo to MathCAD and that changes. So if I update inputs, we now see that the height of the spring is uh, 0.989 inches. Now we can do some what if scenarios. So depending on what I want to use the spring in and specific parameters uh, that are needed to drive the spring, um, I can change uh, these values up here. So if the allowable shear stress is going to be lower, 200 megapascals. Um, right now, uh, I have, uh, let's just concentrate on this value, uh, number of calls is 11. Once the MathCAD worksheet calculates, you see now that's changed to 13. And these two values changed as well. So I can save and share with Creo, go to Creo, regenerate, and you'll see that the, the spring changed. So right now, we have an embedded MathCAD worksheet that always lives with this Creo part that contains engineering calculation uh, information that you can change to drive parameters and dimensions in that Creo part. Um, and, and you can perform a number of what if scenarios to, to determine the, the correct size and dimensions of that spring for the application you need to use it within. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Andy, that was great. So hopefully you all learned something from these tips today. We welcome your feedback on this session and you'll be receiving a survey via email shortly after the event. Lastly, I did want to direct you to an open house event run by PTC User, where they'll introduce you to the technical committees. PTC User is an independent voice of users of, uh, of PTC software. These committees have been in operation for over 30 years. Each committee is composed of PTC customers from across industry who work directly with product management to help improve the products. These groups are always looking to grow the numbers of participants. If you're interested in being part of a group of PTC and Creo users that help to guide the future direction of the product, I would encourage you to attend the session at 3 p.m. EST on Wednesday, June 10th to learn how you can get involved. And just to wrap up again, my name is Paul Sager, and I hope you found this session useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or the rest of the team here today. Thank you.